All right, well, thank you very much, Professor Ernst. And you can hear me OK when I'm talking like this. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm very pleased to see that there's a lecture series on spatial practices. And um, I'm very pleased to be in this lovely hall with all, all of you who have come out at 6 o'clock in the evening, which for us is a very unusual time to be giving a lecture. Um, thanks for coming here. Um, <clears throat> now, my understanding is that Excuse me, all of you were sent a handout, which I suspect almost none of you have brought with you. <clears throat> if you have brought the handout with you, please put your hand up. Okay, so I will assume that people do not have the handout. This is the handout up here. Now let me ex explain the background to the handout. Um, <clears throat> I am a philosopher by training. And philosophy, I'm sure it's the same in, in the Netherlands, is what we call a very muscular discipline. This means it thinks, as it's, thinks of itself as a very demanding, difficult enterprise that only certain special human beings should be admitted to. And in fields such as this, um, it is the habit of people to read written papers. And I have to say, I have never disabused myself of this habit. I have yet personally to find it very useful. I sometimes bring pictures, just like photographs, to keep the audience entertained while I talk. And I didn't this time, um, <clears throat> but I tend to produce handouts. And the idea of the handout is that all the main points of the talk are on the handout. And you actually don't have to listen to me at all. Uh, but you have to because there are no pictures this time. So you better listen to me or, or you know, I'm sure there are a lot of other things you could do too. Um, but in any case, um, we've got the handout on the, um, on the screen here. So try to use it as you can so that you can just listen to me instead of trying to write anything down. Because that's the idea, to relieve the audience of the cognitive burden of having to write and listen at the same time. So I really want you just to listen. And <clears throat> maybe you can, um, I'll try to reference the handout as we go. Uh, because unfortunately, my talk is very abstract. And all my talks are very abstract. I am still a philosophical social theorist. OK, with that um, introduction past us, um, I should also explain that what's going to make it even harder is I'm primarily going to talk about my own ideas tonight, OK, with only a few references to other people's, so you're not being helped out very much here. OK, so this talk is called The Spaces of Practices and Large Social Phenomena. My talk today offers a practice theoretical analysis of large social phenomena and their spaces. It begins, moreover, with a few words about social practices in space. This preamble coheres, of course, with the title of this lecture series, Spatial Practices. The principal reason I begin with this topic, however, is that what I have to say about the spaces of social practices informs my account of large social phenomena and their spaces. So the first section of the talk is spatial practices. And that says social. Oh, look, already a mistake. That's supposed to say spatial, not social. The juxtaposition of the term spatial and practices is apt. For practices are inherently spatial, and the spaces pertinent to social life are ever increasingly the product of practices. The social practices that make spaces themselves are and have spaces. Now, as I construe them, and here we're on point A, practices are nexuses of human activity, open-ended sets of doings and sayings organized by understandings, rules, and teleoaffectivities. I'm not going to be talking about that organization all today, so don't worry about it. These organized activities are inevitably and often essentially bound up with material entities. Doings and sayings, for example, are carried out by embodied human beings, even if these people are physically disabled. Just about every practice, moreover, deals with material entities, including humans, that people manipulate or react to. 
and most practices would not exist without materialities of the sorts they deal with, just as most material arrangements that practices deal with would not exist in the absence of these practices. Because the relationship between practices and material arrangements is so intimate, I believe that the notion of a bundle of practices and arrangements, and not just that of a practice simpliciter, is fundamental to analyzing social phenomena. Now I should put a footnote in here that most people who use the term practices mean entities along with the human activities. So they are already amalgamating materiality and activities in one entity and they call it practices. In the philosophical uh, people like Wittgenstein that I, that I come out of, practices meant essentially the activities. And so that's why there, so there's a terminological uh, disparity here. The conviction that some amalgam of activity and materiality is ontologically and dynamically fundamental to social analysis is shared by a range of contemporary theoretical approaches, including actor network theory, socio-cultural theories of mediated action, object-centered socialities, and some accounts of science. Incidentally, by a material arrangement, I mean linked people, organisms, artifacts, and things. To say that practices and arrangements bundles is to say, one, that practices affect, give meaning to, use, and are inseparable from arrangements, while two, arrangements channel, prefigure, facilitate, and are essential to practices. I said, so now we're on to 1C. I said that social practices make and have spaces. Since we're going to talk about bundles of practices and arrangements, the idea is that practice arrangement bundles have and make spaces. Now, such bundles are inherently spatial in two key ways. First, the material arrangements a bundle encompasses, including the bodies of the people who perform the actions that make up the practices that are part of the bundle, these arrangements form objective spatial configurations. And we can talk, if you're interested later, about what I mean by objective. Activities, human activities are localized in objective space because doings and sayings are largely bodily performances and thereby located at the bodies involved. The bodily movements that occur when people perform the doings and sayings that compose a practice together with the material, other material entities that form arrangements bundled with that practice, form an objective spatial configuration. Okay, that's the first part of that. A second way practice arrangement bundles are inherently spatial is that they boast interwoven activity time spaces. Activity, now that's a term of art of, of mine. Activity time space has both a temporal and a spatial component. Its temporal component pertains to the teleologies and motivations that govern activities and will be set aside in what follows. I'm only going to talk about the spaces. The spatial component of activity time space embraces arrays of places and paths where a place is a place to perform such and such an action and a path is a way from one place to another. So this lectern is a place from which to speak. There is a place anchored in this physical object that we call a lectern. Places and paths pertain to human activity not just because they are places and paths for activity, but also because people proceed through the course of their day sensitive to the arrays of places and paths around them. Now, activity time spaces, strictly speaking, are features of individual activities or lives. As I explain in a moment, however, the spaces or the time spaces of different people's activities interweave due to common, shared, and orchestrated components. So that's the um, very last line here. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. These common, shared, and orchestrated components are features of the practice arrangement bundles of which the activities concerned are elements. Any such bundle, any practice arrangement bundle exhibits a complex activity space that embraces common, shared, and orchestrated places for performing the actions that make up the practices, the bundle's practices, and common, shared, and orchestrated paths for getting between these practices. 
These places and paths are also anchored in the entities that make up the bundle's arrangements. Now, I am not claiming that objective configurations and path place arrays exhaust the spatial features of practice arrangement bundles. Neither phenomenon, for instance, does justice to the spatiality of the lived body. I believe, however, that these two phenomena are of prime importance for analyzing social entities, including large ones. Consequently, I will focus on them in what follows. Okay, so we finished bundles are spatial. They have objective spatial, they contain objective spatial configurations and, and are marked by interwoven, uh, interwoven time spaces. But practice arrangement bundles are not just inherently spatial. They bear considerable responsibility for their own spaces and also contribute to the spaces of other bundles. To begin with, the activities that compose practices intervene in the world. And among the changes that they affect or that thereby result are new spatial, objective spatial arrangements of entities. In this way, practices bear responsibility for the objective spaces of the arrangements with which they are bundled and either directly or through intervening chains of action help affect the objective spaces of other bundles. Of course, the actions of entities other than humans also result in altered arrangements and spaces. So that's the first part. They alter material arrangements. A second way, and this part's going to get a little bit complicated. This is maybe the most complicated section of the paper. A second way that bundles are responsible for their own spaces is via the normative organization of the practices that are part of the bundle. As indicated, activity spaces interweave by a common, shared, and orchestrated elements. And I'm now going to explain what that means. Places and paths are common to participants in a practice when, when participants proceed through the same places and paths anchored at the same entities or types thereof and do this because this anchoring is enjoined in the practice's normative organization. So to take an example you all are familiar with, in a classroom, there are various places. There are places to sit and listen and take notes. There are places for the teacher to stand and speak and maybe write on the board or the smart board or manipulate the keyboard. There are places to exit and to enter. These are all common to the people who are participating in teaching practices. And they are common to all these people because it's enjoined in these practices that students are to sit here, that the teacher is to stand here. This does not prohibit that other things go on, but that is a commonality that they share. Places and paths are shared when participants proceed through the same places and paths, but the practice's normative organization does not enjoin these places and paths, but simply deems them acceptable. So let's take the same example. The commonality is that the teacher's at the front of the classroom and the students are at the desks or the benches. However, the teacher can quite easily walk all around the classroom and lecture or talk from the back of the classroom too. And that's perfectly acceptable. So that is something they share. I'm making a distinction here between commonality and sharedness. Commonality is a form of sharedness that is enjoined of people, whereas sharedness is a commonality, a sameness, which is, you might say, just accidental. It's simply accidental that the teacher is in the back of the classroom, but it's not accidental that the teacher is in the front of the classroom lecturing the people and that the students are at their desks. So that's commonality, sharedness, and finally there's orchestration. Paths and places are orchestrated finally when different places and paths are independently anchored in the same or different material entities for different participants in the practice. So let's imagine there's a computer monitor and keyboard in the classroom. And we've got a bunch of uh, seventh and eighth grade students, let's say, in the classroom. And for some of those students, the, the, um, the computer, the compu where the computer is located might be a place where they can go contact their friends or surf the web. Whereas for the teacher, that is a place in which to enforce discipline in the classroom. So here we have two places anchored at the same physical, physical spot. 
The two places are not independent of one another. That it's a place to maintain discipline for the teacher is tied to the fact that it's a place for the students to, well, many different things. So that's an example of orchestration, and there's a lot of that in human life, in that if you have a, a set of objects, different people, same practices, the different people in the practices, for the different places may be anchored in the same objects for different people, but these are all connected with one another somehow by virtue of what goes on in the practice, the whole range of activities that makes it up. Okay, so time spaces um, are interwoven by virtue of these common, shared, and orchestrated elements. And the normative organization of the practices that are part of a bundle shapes these interwoven spaces that characterize the bundle by circumscribing the common, shared, and orchestrated elements involved. And there's a long story there to be told. Now, practice organization is not the only phenomenon that, that shapes such interwoven spaces. Material arrangements also contribute to common, shared, and orchestrated spaces in being one self-same set of entities at which places and paths are anchored for participants at large. Okay, so let's summarize up this first section. Practice arrangement bundles exhibit objective spaces and interwoven activity spaces for which the practices and the arrangements involved are co-responsible. These objective and interwoven spaces pertain to large social phenomena as well. Because as I will now explain, large social phenomena are slices or aspects of constellations of practice arrangement bundles. And because of this, their objective spaces include those and their time spaces draw on those of the linked bundles they encompass. Oops. All right, thanks. Okay, section two, large social phenomena. Now by large social phenomena, I mean such entities as economies, governments, military alliances, socio-technical regimes, a fine Dutch concept, educational establishments, international federations, and sports leagues. As just indicated, these phenomena on my analysis are simply constellations of bundles of practices and arrangements. And I'm going to skip a section here where I try to position this analysis between individualistic social ontologies and other ontologies that, that, that um, advocate systems, structures, things like that. Now, I have long argued that social life, by which I simply mean human coexistence, inherently transpires as part of practice <coughs> arrangement bundles. If this is true, then the totality of such bundles marks out the plenum in which any social phenomena, event, or state of affairs inherently takes place. What there is in the world to any such social phenomena, event, or formation is some set of slices or aspects of this plenum of practices and arrangements. All social phenomena, large and small, micro and macro, local and global, all of them share the same basic ingredients and form of composition. Now, I might illuminate this analysis if I first point out a parallel between it and Latour's ontology, Bruno Latour's ontology. I am claiming, in effect, that all there is to social affairs are linked practices and arrangements. Not only do bundled practices and arrangements provide the basic stuff, if you will, in which social affairs consist, but the total plenum of linked practices and arrangements, the total stuff, delimits the possible objective spatial and temporal shapes of social phenomena. Similarly, Latour holds that all there are to social affairs, or to anything else for that matter, are associations and amorous associations, all linked. An association is, at a first approximation, a set of linked actors. To be an actor is to do something, or in his later variant, to make something else happen. And just about anything qualifies, as if those of you who have read Latour, just about anything qualifies an act, as an actor. Humans, organisms, artifacts, things, all the things that I say make up arrangements. 
So any state of affairs having to do with humans, and thus any social state of affairs, embraces an association of humans and non-humans. Now, Latour's associations bear an obvious resemblance to what I am calling arrangements. His account, however, recognizes nothing comparable to what I am calling practices. On my account, social affairs consist not just in connected associations, as Latour holds, but in linked arrangements and practices. This difference, those of you who know Latour a little bit too, this difference also reflects Latour's individualism, or as he puts it, nominalism. On his view, an action is a property of a particular human or non-human entity and only contingently related to any other action or actor. I certainly agree that particular actions are performed by particular people. On my view, however, the performance of an action is inherently part of a nexus of doings and sayings that is a practice. And there's a very deep ontological difference there. Now, social phenomena consist in slices or aspects of, of this plenum of practices and arrangements. Large social phenomena, accordingly, consist in large slices and aspects of bundles. A slices and aspects, in other words, of constellations of many bundles. Now, this formulation implies that bundles connect. And I'll speak in a moment about the kinds of link among bundles by virtue of which they form constellations. These kinds of relations are of the kinds that either connect practices to arrangements or connect practices to other practices and arrangements to other arrangements. Because the same kinds of link join practices and arrangements on the one hand and bundles of practices and arrangements on the other, a constellation of bundles is just a larger and possibly more complex bundle a larger and possibly more complex linkage of practices and arrangements. The difference between smaller and larger social phenomena is the difference between lesser and greater spatial temporal extension of the practices, arrangements, and relations that compose them. Now, I'm going to start developing an, a running example at this point through the paper. So consider a university. Now, unfortunately, universities in the United States are organized a little different than in Europe, so you're going to have to imagine the US example a little bit. Functionally, a university is composed of a set of organizations. In the United States, these are most prominently things like colleges, like one is arts and sciences. I'm in a college of arts and sciences. Those are all the traditional uh, disciplines at a university. But you might have a college of business, a college of engineering, a medical college, an education college, and so on. So you've got a bunch of colleges, a central administration, you have research and pedagogical centers or institutes. There are a variety of support units like an admissions department, a parking office, a housing office, since students tend to live in dorms provided by the university, an alumni association, and an athletics department, perhaps the most important department of all. That was a joke. Mater materially, these organizations embrace faculty, staff, and students as well as the many rooms, buildings, trees, lawns, and other building design structures found at the university. Now, an organization, like any other social phenomena, is a set of linked practices and arrangements. So take a college. A college, for, for example, embraces a bunch of practices, lecturing practices, grading practices, PowerPoint practices, the practices of giving exams, the practices involved with active pedagogy, and so forth. And all these practices are carried out in classrooms, offices, out on the lawns, in the clearings, um, and so forth and so on. So those are the material arrangements on the one hand and the practices on the other. All these teaching practices are linked to a variety of what you might call self-governance practices that involve meetings and discussion and that are carried out in meeting rooms and offices and hallways and so forth. And all these teaching and self-governance practices are tied to further sets of bundles, such as research bundles. So all the practices that, that go on in the lab, or the practices that go in the library and so forth, carried out in the labs or in the libraries. And all these are all interconnected. And all these bundles are also connected with the bundles that make up the other sub 
organizations of the university, the other colleges, central administration, the housing office, the athletic departments. After all, student athletes take your courses, so you're connected with the athletics department, and so forth and so on. So the university, as you can see, is one big maze of practices and arrangements. Looked at at a certain scale, of course. Now, uh, we're at now at 2C. And I'm going to try to simplify this section and only do part one here, okay? Just to give you some idea of what I mean by relations. And skip out, there's a lot of sort of typologizing going on here, uh, which um, I will spare you. I said that the relations through which bundles link in the constellations are the relations through which practices and arrangements themselves linked or are tied to other instances, other practices and arrangements. So let's just consider the first case. How do practices and, and arrangements relate to one another? And what I'm going to argue is that the same relations that link an individual practice with an individual arrangement are the same relations that will link constellations of practices with nexes or networks of material arrangements. So I've listed the five of them here under C1. There are five types of relations. And I'll, let me just say a brief word about each of them. Causal relations. There are two prominent forms. Activities altering the world, as I mentioned before, but also the entities and the events that befall them inducing activities. So those are the two most prominent forms of causality. I'm going to skip the prefiguration because that's a term of art. As for constitution, Arrangements constitute practices either when they are essential to those practices or are pervasively involved with them over a swath of space-time. Students are essential in this sense to teaching practices, no, teaching pra no students, no teaching practices, just as classrooms have helped constitute teaching practices for decades. Conversely, practices constitute arrangements when given arrangements would not exist were it not for particular practices. In this sense, teaching arrangements constitute the classroom arrangements where they, um, where they occur. Without teaching practices, you wouldn't have classrooms. But they don't constitute the walkways that students and instructors take to and from the classrooms. OK, fourth type, intentionality. This is really a mi mind and action relatedness. Practices are intentionally related to arrangements by, via the thoughts and imaginings that participants have about them and the actions participants perform toward them. Teachers, for instance, today, think various things about smart boards. You all know what a smart board is, right? I'm, what, I don't know how you'd say that in Dutch. And they think uh, and, and act in various ways towards classroom chair arrangements. And a final sort of relation is intelligibility. Arrangements having meaning for, being intelligible as such and such to participants in a practice. The intelligibility of the entities amid which the activities of a practice are carried out have meanings that are tied to that practice. So those, the example I was using of the front of the classroom as a place to lecture and the, all the chairs and desks as places to sit and take notes or to do whatever else students do those places all are anchored in those objects by virtue of the activities that take place in the classroom, teaching practices. Now, thickets of relations of all five types can be thinner or denser, more compact or spread out, continuing or fleeting, and so on. Relations of these sorts are typically very thick between the practices and arrangements that compose a bundle. In fact, it is this concentration of relatedness, its density and continuity that makes it the case that a bundle exists. Teaching practices, for example, maintain particularly thick causal relations with the students, the chalk, or the marker, or the computer keyboard, the, all those things, the essays, the blogs, on which the people carrying them out immediately act the students and markers and so forth with which teaching practices maintain thick <coughs> causal relations also tend to be the entities with which they maintain constitutional relations. You don't have the one without the other. You don't have the entity without the practice and vice versa. 
and the meaning of the, whose meanings the practices subtend. It is with these entities that teaching forms a bundle. <coughs> And of course, you can have these same relationships between the practices of one bundle and, let's say, the arrangements in another. The teacher, the teacher uh, who is in front of the classroom, can also have all kinds of thoughts about the principal or the central administration, and that's a relatedness uh, into another into another practice uh, arrangement bundle. Okay. Now I'm going to skip, as I said, C two and three. I've listed the type of relations on the hand, uh, up on the handout. Uh, these are the types of relations that link either practices to other practices or arrangements to other arrangements. So the picture that I'm trying to paint here is you have a plenum of arrangements, of material arrangements, arrangements of material entities, and organized human activities. The, the organized human activities relate to the material entities, the arrangements in a variety of ways. The practices can relate to one another, as also can the arrangements relate to one another. All kinds of physical relations. You know, think about the relations between the power plant that produces electricity and the classroom. I mean, there's a physical connection between two different sets of arrangements there. So there's a, so all the practices and arrangements that exist are all interconnected in these kinds of ways. And this ramifies across the entire globe. So to sum up what I'm saying about large social phenomena, the types of relation that link practices and arrangements into bundles also link bundles in the constellations. Social affairs inherently transpire as part of a mass of continually evolving linked practices and arrangements that are spread out across the globe and extends a little bit into outer space. All social phenomena are slices or aspects of this mass. Social phenomena differ in the continuity, density, and spatial temporal spread and shape of both the practices and arrangements that compose them and the relations among these practices and arrangements. Okay, so let's turn now to Section three, I'm going to combine section one and section two in section three, which will be brief, and then the last section will be, out, be about the notion of levels. <laughs> section one explained that a practice arrangement, that practice arrangement bundles contain objective spaces tied to their material arrangements, which include the bodies performing the doings and sayings that compose the practices involved. Practice arrangement bundles also exhibit interwoven time spaces whose spatial components consist of common shared and orchestrated arrays of places and paths anchored in the arrangements of all. I have since explained that social phenomena consist in slices and aspects of the plenum of linked practices and arrangements, and that such phenomena are large when the slices and aspects that constitute them are relatively more spatially and temporally extended. Large and small are relative terms that signal greater versus lesser spatial temporal extension and often, though not always, looser versus denser relations. So a larger social phenomenon is characterized by looser relations and a smaller social phenomenon is characterized by denser relations of all those sort of minute types that I was cataloging before. It follows that the spaces of large social phenomena are simply more extensive and differently shaped versions of the spaces of practice arrangement bundles. So that's I did, what I just said is under point A there. Let's go back to the university. Each college, now remember there's the business college, the engineering college, the medical college, and the arts and sciences college. Each college at a US university is a constellation of bundles. I guess you could do it with faculties here in most European universities. Since you lack all that other stuff, athletics departments, alumni associations, and it's just the academic dimensions plus a central administration. So, but we've got all this other stuff. So each college is a constellation of bundles pertaining to the teaching, research, outreach, that's community involvement, and self-management business of academic departments, or to the jobs of the dean's office, the IT, the information technology unit, the public relations unit, and so forth. 
Each of these bundles embraces differentially evolving arrangements composed of human bodies and the material entities they make up. Offices, classrooms, hallways, laboratories, meeting rooms, communication systems, and the like. These arrangements institute objective spaces of the sort exhibited in any bundle. So, a college, a university, has the same material arrangement, just bigger than does, let's say, teaching practices in their connection with the classroom. It's just more bigger. Same relations, linking the things together. These arrangements that are associated with the college overlap with and connect to the arrangements that are part of the bundles that compose other organizations at the university, such as the other colleges, central administration, the admissions office, and the athletic program. It is clear that the continual changes that occur to these objective spaces are largely brought about through actions performed by participants in the practices involved, thus through teachers, students, administrators, and what we call staff. Other changes originate from outside the practice arrangement bundles involved. For instance, termites. You all know what termites are, right? I don't know. You maybe don't have termites in Holland. Electrical outages and tornadoes where I live. The complex, cyclical, and mutable character of a university's objective, state, objective space is patent. In addition to objective spaces, uh, let's see, where are we on the hand line? Um, okay, we are in the middle of that first arrow. In, in addition to objective spaces, any social for formation exhibits interwoven time spaces or interwoven activity spaces whose spatial component encompasses common, shared, and orchestrated paths and places through which the formation's members proceed. So consider teaching in a classroom or conducting research in a lab. The people who are involved with those practices are caught up in an interwoven activity space that contains common and shared places. As I've been saying, to stand, to sit, to take notes, to enter, to gaze out the window, or to titrate, to heat up, to read, to read uh, instrumentation, and so forth. The more complex the practice and setting involved, the more complex this interwoven space is, this common and shared space. Large social phenomena also exhibit activity spaces. The people who participate in the practice arrangement bundles that compose an academic department for example, or a faculty, are enveloped in a net of interwoven spaces that adds to the interwovenness established in particular practice setting pairs, the interwovenness that helps join the department's multiple practice. There are practices of teaching, practices of research, practices of self-administration. There may be political practices connecting with other faculties. It helps join the, all, all the department, department's multiple practices and different material arrangements, all the different places where those practices take place. So there's, a, there's an interwovenness in, spatial, uh, in the activity of space that marks this complex that, that is much more complex and extended than is the interwoven space, spatiality in the classroom or in the research lab. And if you jump up a level now to the university, you can see that you're adding then to the complex interwoven spaces of each of the departments or faculties and colleges just more of the same all connected to the original. The space of any particular social phenomenon, such as a university, includes the objective spaces and activity spaces encompassed or established by the practice arrangement bundles that make up this phenomenon. I just read that sentence up there. These spaces are tied to the activities practice organizations, and arrangements involved. It is obvious that the objective spaces and interwoven time spaces of large phenomena are fabulously complex. And how to deal with that fact in social research is a topic for a different paper. Okay, I want to turn now to the last section of this paper, which is about the, the, the pervasive and promiscuous notion of levels. Many of what I am calling large social phenomena qualify as macro or even global and sometimes structural phenomena. So there's words one hears a lot. This is true of economies, 
some corporations, socio-technical regimes, and maybe national governments and educational establishments, though it is not true of sports leagues, many other corporations, smaller ones, and local governments. The contrast with macro and global are, of course, micro and local. All these terms are spatial. Another important spatial issue concerning social phenomena, consequently, is the applicability to them of the terms macro, micro, meso, global, local, and indeed, large and small, the ones I've been using without focusing on this. The meanings of these terms are often tied to another issue in social theory, namely the advisability of thinking that society or social life are composed of levels. Now, I have construed large and small as relative terms, which, of course, they are grammatically. Large phenomena are more spatially temporal extended than small ones are. Which phenomena, however, qualify as large versus small, or small versus large, depends on, as philosophers call it, the universe of comparison. A university is large compared to a particular student making up an examination in her professor's office. But a university is small in comparison to the entire United States educational establishment. Macro and micro and global and local can be similarly construed and sometimes are as relative terms. Often, however, they are treated as denoting substantial phenomena. And in this section, I want to focus on one particularly prominent substantial division between macro and micro that is also sometimes applied to global and local, though global and local is quite different than macro and micro. After all, there's a globe. Makes a big difference. Now, according to this very prominent interpretation, these terms designate distinct levels, or to speak Deleuzean, distinct planes, if you will, of society or social life. Now, here's maybe where I go wrong, because I want to turn to philosophy for an elucidation of this idea of levels. The reason I call this notion very promiscuous is that the word is just thrown around, from a philosopher's point of view, the word is just thrown around with no, with no making precise of really what it means. And it drives philosophers crazy, because the notion of levels of reality ever since Plato has been a very, very prominent notion. So philosophers have worked out very precise understandings of what a level is and what the relations among levels might be. So um, this is uh, right under B now, the definition. In the philosophy of science, levels of reality are conceived of as domains of entities between which systematic relations of causality, constitution, or supervenience exist. Don't worry about what supervenience means. The two most familiar alleged levels attributed to society are one, they're up here, a micro level composed of individuals together with their actions and interactions, and two, a macro level containing entities such as social structures, systems, institutions, and the like. I'm sure you're all familiar with this distinction. These two alleged levels are distinct. Either if what populates the macro level, that is structures and so the like, if what populates the macro level systematically arises from, are systematically constituted by, or systematically supervene on what populates the micro level, that is individuals and their activities, or the other way around, if what's on the micro level, the structures, the institutions, and so forth, exert systematic causal effects on what's on the micro level, the individuals and their activities. So there's gotta be some systematic relatedness between the entities of one sort and the entities of the other. Now, Mac, typically, at least in North America, it's less true in Europe. In North America, above all, macro level phenomena are often conceived of as arising from, whatever that means, micro ones. Though, and then especially in Europe, some prominent theories, for instance, structural Marxism, think Althusser as perhaps the most classic recent example, they reverse the dependence, and still many other theories envision a reciprocal relationship between entities on the two levels. Now, what's common to all three of these types of positions is the presupposition that the levels make sense. Now, all, on my account, all social phenomena transpire in the plenum of linked practices and arrangements. This implies that institutions, all the things on the macro level, 
the institutions, and the structures, and the systems are features of this plenum. But it turns out, so too are most actions and many mental states of individuals. And that's another long, mostly philosophical argument. It follows that neither social structures and their like, what's on the macro level, nor individuals and their actions, what's on the micro level, constitute distinct levels at all. They are instead different general sorts of collections of features and elements of this one plenum. Now that's a mouthful, so it's uh, B2 there. What's on the micro level and what's on the macro level are simply different general sorts of collections of the same stuff. Society and social life, accordingly, are not composed of these two particular alleged levels. Nor are society or social life identical with either of these alleged levels alone. And there are no other levels, furthermore, different from these two, that constitute society. Now, I, will, there, I do acknowledge the existence of what Deleuze and Guattari call the molecular level. The molecular level embraces the composition of what appears in the plenum of practices and arrangements. So it embraces such things as the physiochemical composition of artifacts and things of nature, the biophysical subsystems, as well as the physical movements of things, of living things, so humans and other organisms. And the material composition and organization of these entities can be relevant to the progress of social life. For instance, they enable actions and other events to occur. Try moving without the composition of your body. They ensure spatial temporal persistence. That's a philosophical claim. And they can affect the molar activities and properties of people, of the people and other entities they compose. But although practice arrangement bundles might depend on and reflect a molecular materiality, they do not systematically arise from it. And that's the key point. You're not denying the existence of what makes up all the entities. But what makes them up bears only a haphazard relationship to what happens in social life. So it's not a level in the sense in which people who worry about micro and macro in terms of levels are often worrying. And as I said, social life has no, as Latour calls it, no above no structure or system that collects, encompasses, holds, or determines practices, arrangement, bundles, and constellations. What then is the relation between macro and micro phenomena? Macro phenomena, like micro ones, are particular slices and aspects of the plenum of linked practices and arrangements. You've heard that a lot now. The relations that exist between them depends on how the terms macro and micro are interpreted, since they get interpreted in many different ways, and how the slices and aspects of the plenum that constitute particular micro and macro phenomena relate. This means there is no general relationship between them. There's only particular sets of relations between particular things that some person or some group or other calls micro and macro. In general, between, because macro and ma micro phenomena alike consist in slices and aspects of the same one plenum of arrangements and practices, diverse relations, as opposed to systematic ones, exist between them. For instance, the National United States Educational Establishment, a macro phenomena, and a particular class at a university might relate not to any systematic relationship of constitution or supervenience, but through multiple relationships shared and orchestrated ends, common and shared places, a large number of intentional relationships, and all sorts of chains of actions that embrace the circulation of educational materials, the propagation of rules, and the percolation outwards of innovations. And the same comments apply to global and local phenomena, which certainly do not represent distinct levels. Instead of examining social life through the idea of distinct systematically related levels, it is better to think of a single plenum of practices and arrangements that varies in the thinness and thickness and in the directness and circuitiveness of relations among practices and arrangements. As defined by these variations and gradients, practices and arrangements form bundles and constellations of smaller and larger spatial temporal spread. 
This ontology promotes, as, a key, as perhaps the key dimension of variation in so, social phenomena, not things like micro and macro and global and local, but simply smaller and larger, which is why from the beginning I've simply been using the terms without reflection. I don't think, and this thesis is not original. I believe, for instance, that it is Gabriel Tard's. It also, I believe, is Randall Collins' position, if any of you know his work on my, um, uh, what is it, micro interaction chains. Tard, in particular, held that much social development takes the form of unidirectional progressions that begin from a small version of something and eventuate in a large version of it. A good example is war and competition among individuals winding into strife between larger groups, which in turn enlarge into war and competition between very large collectivities such as nations. Now, I don't think that many large social phenomena arise, is in the, arise in this unidirectional expansionary way. Nonetheless, this progression illustrates an important theme, namely that what contrasts with small phenomena, namely large phenomena, these large phenomena cannot be construed as something fundamentally indifferent in kind than the small ones. So to concretize this position, let's come back to the university. This example is a bit misplaced since nothing about the university is a macro and, or global phenomena, and no one, I think, would consider the university and its sub-organizations to lie on distinct, substantial levels. Still, the components of the university illustrates the flattening of social life that I advocate. And the basic idea is this, I'm not going to read this, is that you have, the you have departments, you know, so a geography department, a mathematics department, a physics department. They're part of a college. They have a bunch of practices and arrangements that are all connected. Then there is the college administration. The college administration, the dean's office, is not above in any sense. It is simply alongside and amidst the practices and arrangements of all the different departments. It's just more of that added on and interspersed through. And then if you think there are other colleges, you've now added on other sort of, you might say, different galaxies of relationships. And then if you think of the central administration, I, I don't know what it's called in Holland, but like the vice, the vice chancellor's office in an English university or a provost or a chancellor in an American university. It's not above in any sense. It's just more alongside interspersed through. So everything that is represented in the functional organization of a university is just spread all alongside each other. That its practices and arrangements are all interconnected with each other sometimes more densely, and that's what a department is, maybe more loosely, and that's the whole university. But they're all laid out on the same level. There's nothing hierarchical. There are no levels in any sense to this. And all of social life is this way. An economy is not on a different level than all the particular, all the practices and arrangements that make up companies or markets or state investment offices or whatever else goes to make up an economy. This picture of the social can be called a flat ontology. Individualism in its many forms is the original version of a flat ontology because it reduces everything social to the plane of individuals and their relations. Of course, individualists have not understood themselves to be laying out social life on a single plane. That idea of the plane is very alien to individualism. A more explicit flat ontology is found in Deleuze and Guattari, who treat social society or the social as one of many planes that compose reality. The last few things I'm going to say is about Latour, because Latour has recently, if any of you have read his 2005 book, he's appropriated the term flat ontology. And he uses it to name the idea that all there is to social entities, or anything else for that matter, is associations and more associations. And that there's nothing larger, such as social systems or structures, that hold these associations in place. Incidentally, if those of you who know Latour, what happened to black boxing in his latest way of thinking about things? Okay, now these ideas converge with my picture of social entities as slices or aspects of linked practices and arrangement, arrangements minus the practices. So this is what Latour says about macro phenomena. They are not wider and more encompassing sites. It's not like an economy encompasses all the economic phenomena in a society. A macro phenomenon is simply a, low, a particular type of micro site, namely one that's con connected with many others. 
So in the university context, an example is the dean's office. So take the university. It's the dean's office and the provost's office, or the vice chancellor's office. These are the macro phenomena at the university because they're connected with lots of other sites, with all the faculties, all the departments. And that qualifies them as macro. So having lots of connections makes you macro. So you see, Latour wants to hold on to the language of macro and treat it as just a particular type of micro phenomenon. And he calls these oligoptica, sites that see a narrow band of other sites very well. Because of course the provost's office doesn't see very well into the prime minister's office of the country, right? It just sees it's well connected with all a bunch of particular offices at the university. Now, I, I certainly agree with Latour that a ma macro phenomenon is not a, is not a site. And I agree with what I take to be his basic point there, that all action is local. If you've read his earlier work, you'll be familiar with this idea. Activity can achieve effects at a distance only through intermediaries such as email, letters, and chains of action. I also concur with Latour's claim that place, size, and scale are produced. Latour, however, links this claim to his analysis of macro phenomena and argues that large phenomena, such as economies, exist only through the actions of these special local sites. And he's got several types, not just oligoptica. So he, another word for these, if you're familiar with the lingo, are power centers. So the idea is that large phenomena exist only through the actions that are performed at certain power centers. And what makes them power centers is that they have an unusually dense set of relations with lots of other sites. And so if something happens in the power center, the effects end up in a lot of places. Now, according to Latour, size is achieved only through actions performed in these power centers because large phenomena exist only when multiple sites are linked and multiple sites can be linked only via actions performed in these, these power centers. Now, as I've been saying, these power centers certainly exist. The dean's office, the provost's office, the mayor's office in a town, so forth, the treasurer's office, the you know, captain of the police's office, and so forth. These all are power centers in Latour's sense. And activities in these sites establish links with multiple bundles. Let's stick with the university example. And because of these links, you get phenomena such as college initiatives, campus-wide campaigns. You guys don't have this kind of thing where like the whole campus is supposed to join in, let's say, you know, celebrating a certain event or, um, you know, fundraising for, you know, from alumni on homecoming weekend. You know, that's when all the, all the alumni come back for a big football game and it's a big push by the university to raise money. So everybody's supposed to get on the act and it requires the action of some power center to make this happen, namely the, pro, the office of the president or the provost and so forth. So there are phenomena like this. But we have to make two points about them. First, this might be mostly a phenomenon of the past. After all, the emergence of mobile communications technology threatens, threatens this very idea. Because a, uh, the, um, the power centers for, for, they don't have to be, but as Latour describes it there, they have fixed material locations. But the second point is the more important one. Latour is blind to the fact that the networks of relation whereby bundles form large constellations need not center on or be anchored in bundles particularly rich in, co in connections, that is the power centers. A college embraces a large number of bundles and adds up to an overall constellation. But the power centers involved are not any more constitutive and only marginally more responsible for the existence of this constellation than are the other bundles involved. Those of you who know anything about the transitions management literature, um, does anybody, anyways, it's the same issue about governance uh, being part of the phenomena and act not actually controlling the phenomena. Latour is right that place, size, and scale are produced, but he's wrong that they are produced only by the actions of the power centers. In particular, he's wrong that multiple sites or bundles can connect only through actions performed in such sites. Size and scale arise from all the types of relationships I've been discussing here. Similarly, a large phenomenon is brought about through all the activities and events that compose its bundles and constellations, not simply those pertaining to power centers. Social life, in other words, is vast, and power centers can only affect so much. Their spheres of influence are limited, 
and a myriad of actions and other sites must be performed in order for social affairs to move in the direction that power centers seek. Indeed, as Hegel, not talking about bundles, observed, and famously observed, the success of power centers depends on actions freely performed in the sites that they affect or influence. In addition, and this is another important type of social phenomenon, it sometimes happens that the confluence of large numbers of actions drive social affairs in a particular direction. Examples include stock market gyrations, economic crashes and booms, and sudden large-scale political adjustments. Power centers certainly play a role in many, if not practically all, instances of such events. More often than not, however, nets of cascading chains of action simply pass through the power centers, and the character of the power centers as power centers is not essential to what happens. So to sum up, what is essential to a flat ontology is Tard's intuition that large phenomena have the same composition that smaller phenomena do and arise from actions emanating from the small phenomena. That, to me, in a capsule form is what a flat ontology is. So, in my hands, this intuition becomes the ideas that large phenomena are far-flung slices and aspects of the plenum of linked practices and arrangements, and that they arise through the myriad of activities and events that bear on and constitute these slices and aspects. It, it follows from the, these ideas, by the way, that the progression of social affairs is thoroughly contingent. This, however, is a topic for another paper. So I'll stop there and thank you for your attention.